Uh, the next speaker is Barry Costa Pierce. And uh, I've known Barry for probably more time than he is prepared to admit in public. Um, but uh, Barry has done some very interesting work over the years. Where am I looking here? Um, and uh, here we go. Um, he's going to tell you about uh, some of the work that he's doing uh, both at UNE and also uh, in cooperation with some of the Canadian uh, colleagues that he's working with. Barry Costa Pierce. Hopefully that's going to work. Well, it's loading Director Hornsby and the Canadian American folks, uh, Dana and Jeff at Maine International Trade, and of course our close colleagues at the University of Maine particularly one of the best Sea Grant programs in the country led by Paul Anderson. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, so what I wanted to do this morning is I wanted to talk about, uh, first of all, the partnerships that we already have ongoing at the University of New England. A bit of a commercial break uh, in sales and marketing. Our little university, we're about 10,000 students. Uh, we have three campuses, main campuses in Biddeford, Maine. Second campus is in Portland, Maine, and then we have a very strong local to global priorities for our, for our ocean students. So we have a campus at the Crossroads of Civilization in Tangier, Morocco, uh, and cooperative programs with the University of Seville, uh, with the University of Belize, and new partnerships with our colleagues in Iceland that are coming on board. So that, with that said, we have a very, very strong interest in local to global. Uh, with Maine being sort of our living laboratory, but a lot of the issues that we deal with here in Maine have a global iteration. So we want the next generation of coastal leaders to be exposed and go deep into local issues, which oftentimes are very similar globally. Uh, and you probably could think about many of these issues. Uh, my other p talking point, which I'll follow on with Michael, is you know, as we go forward with our world today, uh, only one to four percent of all human foods is derived from the ocean. And if we restore all capture fisheries, well, first of all, let's just step back for a second. Just recently, the UN demographers made an alarming assessment published in Science Magazine, which showed that we're not going to reach uh, stabilization of population by 2100. That's really, really alarming. Uh, it means that we're going to be dealing with anywhere between 10 to 12 billion people on this planet. And population is not predicted to stabilize. Uh, most of those people actually eat seafood as their major protein source, not terrestrial foods. And so Americans eat about 150 pounds per capita per year of meat and only 15 pounds per capita per year of seafood. It's exactly the reverse in many other countries of the world. So seafood is the, is the world's most widely traded global commodity. And so that's, that's kind of the background. So what I wanted to start with today is talk about our university, and then of course I'll talk about our partnerships with the University of New England. I wanted to start with what we're already doing with Atlantic Canada, particularly, and then what we want to do. So what are some of the real opportunities that we feel uh, in our research groups uh, that, that we can build on. You know, the first one is, is with Memorial. We've been working with Memorial for many, many years. Memorial has one of the largest wave tanks uh, in the world, uh, has some of the top fisheries scientists in the world. Uh, and again, uh, it's not only the great issues of scientists, it's really the issues and the problems of the people of the place. And so if you look at Newfoundland, they're dealing now with an amazing recovery of cod. But they're also, and all of what that means for Newfoundland. And so the policy, legal, regulatory, the global conventions, the seafood trade. So that's one part of what we're up there discussing with our colleagues at MI and with Memorial University. The other thing that we're dealing with is the, what we call the Atlantification of the Arctic. So the, things are moving, like we're having blue crabs now being caught in Nova Scotia. Okay, so Things are moving because of climate change and it's going very, very, very fast. And one of the things that's moving very, fast, very fast is spiny dogfish. So I'm going to talk about not only fisheries, but also aquaculture, because that's, the, that's what we need to do, is deliver 
sustainable seafoods to a very crowded planet that's going to be demanding them. So again, seafood is the world's most widely traded global commodity. So we are, you cannot be in this business and just think locally. So the other thing that we're dealing with is dogfish. Uh, spiny dogfish, we have been looking at, we just paper, published a paper two years ago in plus one on the stock assessments from our research set-aside programs with the U.S. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. And we found to our great alarm that they weren't just benthic, that they were throughout the water column from North Carolina to the Canadian border. Well, what that meant that the standing stock assessment that, we, that the National Marine Fisheries Service had was far below of what was out there in the water during different times of the year. So we've, with a four to one male to female ratio that we found in our, some of our assessments, with water column gill nets going up from bottom to the surface, we estimated that sometimes of the year in the Gulf of Maine, there was over 800,000 metric tons of spiny dogfish in the Gulf of Maine. That is unprecedented findings. Uh, it's shocking because that means that they're eating, they're predatory, they're eating cod, haddock, you know, a lot of the ground fish, uh, and they're moving. So they're moving very, very quickly. And the movement patterns obviously are not, does not respect a, a border. And so they're moving into uh, you know, Passamaquoddy Bay, further north. Uh, and our colleagues in, in Memorial are also dealing with another dogfish, the black dogfish. So we've had a number of different projects looking at rapid climate change, changing fisheries, and boy, what does this mean for the fishing industry? It means that lots of change in gear uh, and in equipment and in boats, and then we can't neglect the legal and regulatory system. It's f it, it doesn't have the ability to respond as quickly uh, as the fishing community needs. Um, so the other thing that we're all interested in is threatened species. So we have uh, Low Tech, uh, a Canadian company, uh, and a uh, number of our universities. Outstanding tracking, satellites, e other types of taggings. Uh, they're, they're one of the best companies in the world. So we've been looking at, in order to see these migratory patterns, uh, we've been working with Low Tech and Memorial uh, on that. So uh, I've, in each one of these, I've got sort of the, the Canadian partner and our scientists behind it. And I work actually, uh, my lab works right now on the, the contaminants in dogfish because one of the things that we're not mentioning here, or our colleagues will mention this afternoon, of course, with the, the aim skip and the new trade routes, but so not only are we getting additional products through this region, through the open door of the new trade routes from the Scandinavian countries, but the top fish and chips in UK markets, fish stores, was something called uh, rock salmon for many, many years. Uh, and that's spiny dogfish. And the legal and regulatory issues were all sort of raging about um, sort of contaminants in spiny dogfish. And so we need to know what is the bang for the buck in these, the mega-3 concentrations, mercury, PCBs. And so we need to work with both the EU and the American regulators so you can see it's a multidisciplinary, multifaceted issue about the changing fisheries in uh, this maritime Gulf of Maine bioregion, actually, which all, all goes all the way down to the Grand Banks, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Cape Hatteras in, in, in North Carolina. Um, you can see the next, next part, that's kind of our major partnerships in fisheries is, is with Memorial. Uh, the rest of them is, is partnerships in aquaculture that we've had for a number of years and they're growing. Uh, Michael mentioned uh, the, sustain, the, the sustainable aquaculture uh, Canadian professor uh, uh, who is, the, uh, is, is funded by uh, many Canadian organizations, John Grant, uh, based at Dalhousie. And our partnership with the uh, University of New England, Carrie Byron and myself, we've done a, a quite an amount of work on carrying capacity uh, for shellfish aquaculture in enclosed bays. Uh, we're now taking that another step further and looking at really what they're eating. And believe it or not, there's some very surprising uh, findings there when we look at the stable isotopes of what shellfish species in different parts of bays and different parts of the water column are, are actually eating. That's kind of stunning, right? We've been growing shellfish for a few hundred years. Uh, and do you mean to say we really don't know what they eat? Yeah. 
And so that's kind of a lot of what aquaculture is. In some cases, we're so pioneering, um, it's the fastest growing area of food production in the world, as Sebastian Bell mentioned, but still, um, it's, we need so many people to come into this industry, as well as the technology folks in the rooms, to kind of answer some incredibly basic questions. So that's the second major project, and we think that can go uh, in many different directions. I'll show you a recent paper that we just published in that area with our colleagues. The next part I'm going to talk about is sea vegetables. Um, I'll, I'll mention a lot more about that and how deep that partnership goes with the University of Maine uh, and with the new $20 million CNET project, which as you hear from hopefully from my colleague Paul Anderson. Uh, and then last of all is eels. Uh, eels is one of the craziest species you can ever imagine. Um, Maine's, it's Maine's second largest fishery, most valuable fishery after lobsters. Everything that we're harvesting, we're shipping to China. Everything that we're eating, we're getting back from Asia. And so uh, this is actually a, a very, very deep dialogue, which goes from the Atlantic States Mean Marine Fisheries Commission, which just passed Amendment 4, which has now opened up for all seven ASMFC states an eel quota of 20, 200 pounds per state for aquaculture. Now, the most advanced eel aquaculture in the world, believe it or not, is not in Japan. It's actually at Dalhousie University in Canada. So working with this partnership, a number of different peoples are trying to uh, pioneer sustainable eel aquaculture as an alternative livelihood for some of the people who have existing partnerships in the eel fishery. Okay. And I guess I just got to come down, huh? Okay. So this is a basic research area which many of you, you know, might not know. The world's largest food source is not phytoplankton in the ocean. It's actually particulates. It's detritus. And detritus is unconsolidated organic matter, according to us as ecologists. But what it does is it gets colonized by all kinds of really cool things like bacteria and fungi, et cetera. Uh, and it goes from low protein, from 10, 20 percent, and it goes up to 70% protein. Now, down at the, below the photic zone in the world's oceans, there's 70% protein detritus at immense concentrations. And we're finding that even in shallow waters, that most of the oysters, mussels, shellfish, clams, et cetera, they're not eating phytoplankton. They're not cows. All of our conventional wisdom in marine science says that they're aquatic cows, they graze the grass of the seas. All of our sighting up to this point has been where there's really good phytoplankton or algae, that is the grass that the, these grazers eat, that's the place where you put shellfish, okay? And what we're finding is, well, there's many, many places where shellfish are growing like mad and there's no phytoplankton. There's lots of detritus though. And so we have a, quite a number of papers and students involved in this in both the University of Maine cooperation as well as in our laboratories looking at what's really good detritus. Is it areas where seaweeds are breaking up, they get digested and they get transported and over there is the real good shellfish growing area, et cetera. Uh, salt marsh areas, kelp areas, other areas where terrigenous or terrestrial detritus is. This is a really, really big issue. And again, it's, it's fundamental to understanding where the best places to grow shellfish are on the planet. Um, I'll never forget a project that was done at the University of New Hampshire with the Sea Grant Open Ocean Aquaculture Project, which poised mussels way down below the photic zone in deep, deep, deep waters using technologies that we were modifying lobster boats. With, with fishing, with the fishing community. And the mussels way deep down there grew so fast that the calcium metabolism in the mussels couldn't keep up with the tissue metabolism and the shells were breaking so they couldn't put them into the regular mussel bags that you get them in the market. They had to have a different type of packaging. But the meats were huge. And it really stunned a lot of the scientists to look into the guts of them and find out that it was 99.9% detritus, not, not phytoplankton, not living material. 
So this is a big issue. Okay. Big issue of which I think, uh, co you know, international cooperation is needed. Um, the second thing I want to mention is that there is ecosystem goods and services that are involved in everything that I just mentioned. So we're talking about being a responsible steward of the marine environment. So this is a recent paper that we published together with our colleagues at Dalhousie University. And what we're looking at uh, with those, that cadre of folks is carbon trading, nitrogen trading, and a larger issues of environmental, a complete environmental assessment of shellfish aquaculture. This is something that we're, we're very excited about and we can think about moving the ecosystems, goods and services discussion into the shellfish aquaculture uh, discussion very, very rapidly if we do so as an international body. Okay, so this is something that I really, we, we got involved in and you know, it started when we started <laughs> thinking about seaweeds. Well, we don't call them seaweeds anymore. We call the magic parts of this sea vegetables goes so deep into human health and wellness, not just food, that we can involve every medical school, Harvard School of Public Health, we could involve sort of all the pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals companies into this portfolio. Uh, the, the findings in this portfolio are stunning in terms of, of what these products can contribute to human health and wellness and to the future of the planet from many, many different sides. And as you can see, it's multidisciplinary. We not only need to understand the biology of these, but we also need to know how to engineer the systems so that they can survive and thrive under winter conditions, like Michael pointed out, because these kelps, for example, grow in the winter, which is really cool for the social contract because most of Maine fishermen are lobstering in the summer and they can have an alternative livelihood by kelping, quote unquote, in the winter. So kelp is the new kale, and so all the way along you can see the, the list of, of different uh, science partnerships that we can develop. On the left-hand side, uh, through this partnership with the University of Maine, uh, the University of Maine and the EPSCoR project has allowed a number of small universities like mine to develop the institutional capacity to support the people of the place. So up on the left hand side that picture is that we've, our hatchery is working very actively and we're now giving uh, hundreds of feet of line of, of baby plants, of beautiful produced plants in our laboratory. To those you can see the couple of new farmers there who've just started a new farm in southern Maine. And on the right-hand side is uh, we'll harvest our, our crop. We have an experimental farm uh, in Saco Bay, and we'll harvest our first crop of about a couple tons of kelp, and we'll be giving it to our people working on the culinary side. We'll be giving it to the pharmacy, pharmacy school. We'll be giving it you know, around for them to take a look at some of the marine biotechnology opportunities there. Yeah, and I just wanted to put this one up here because, you know, here's, here's a, a paper that, you know, right out of some of our colleagues in Canada at the Craigie Research Center, you know, a role for dietary macroalgae associated with cardiovascular disease. I mean, this, the Harvard School of Public Health, along with our Canadian colleagues and many other medical schools, these people are now calling themselves sort of sea, seafood doctors. They're trying to get the message to, to, to people who are avoiding seafood because either they're scared they can't cook it or they think that some type of uh, young children or women of, ch of childbearing age or women who are pregnant, there's, there, there's a, a, a movement that has been gone on for about 20 years to, to scare them away from seafood. And so there's a, now a growing movement worldwide, particularly in our region, to, to get out the real messages about seafood uh, and its, its risks and its benefits. Okay, I mentioned spiny dogfish. This is, I've already mentioned this, the 800,000 metric tons. Uh, I just wanted to put down here the, the standing stock assessment of, of, of Atlantic cod in the Gulf of Maine just recently was estimated at about 10,000 tons. So that's 80 times uh, the amount of cod standing crop biomass. Now this is at any one time of the year there could be 800,000 metric tons 
of, of spiny dogfish uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it on this one. Um, I think that when you look at the opportunities for our region, yes, we do not have as a, a population as dense as in many areas of the world. But when you start looking at the world's most widely traded commodity, our resource base, we can steward this resource base so that, and, and look at real reality of that resource base, recover, restore marine fisheries, at the same time steward marine ecosystems, and develop sustainable aquaculture. Now just, I'll tell you how important that latter part is. That it, there was a recent study, uh, or sorry, yeah, study and a keynote speech by the, the dean, Dean Stephen Gaines of the, of the Bren School at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he gave a keynote at, the, at a conference in Malta just recently with an assessment of all of the world's fisheries, finding out that if we were to use best practices for all of the world's fisheries today. We were to move everything over to catch shares. We were to restore all of the marine ecosystem habitats so they could reach their full fisheries production. By 2050, with 10 billion people, we will only meet 2% of projected human needs for seafoods. 2% by restoring all of marine fisheries. Yes, we've got to do this. Yes, this is important for livelihoods, but 98% of global seafoods in the future is going to have to come from aquaculture. So we're going to have to find a way to sustainably develop not only lower trophic level, but also the types of aquaculture that Michael just talked about to sustain the planet and its demands for, for protein food. Thank you very much.